and start the recording and I'm going to share my screen and here we go. Okay. Of Course in Miracles, Chapter 17, Section 7, The Call for Faith. The substitutes for aspects of the situation are the witnesses to your lack of faith. They demonstrate that you did not believe the situation and the problem were in the same place. The problem was the lack of faith. And it is this you demonstrate when you remove it from its source and place it elsewhere. As a result, you do not see the problem. Had you not lacked faith that it could be solved, the problem would be gone. And the situation would have been meaningful to you because the interference in the way of understanding would have been removed. To remove the problem elsewhere is to keep it, for you remove yourself from it and make it unsolvable. There is no problem in any situation that faith will not solve. There is no shift in any aspect of the problem, but will make solution impossible. For if you shift a part of the problem elsewhere, the meaning of the problem must be lost, and the solution to the problem is inherent in its meaning. Is it not possible that all your problems have been solved, but you have removed yourself from the solution? Yet faith must be where something has been done and where you see it done. A situation is a relationship, being the joining of thoughts. If problems are perceived, it is because the thoughts are judged to be in conflict. But if the goal is truth, this is impossible. Some idea of bodies must have entered, for minds cannot attack. The thought of bodies is the sign of faithlessness, for bodies cannot solve anything. It is their intrusion on the relationship, an error in your thoughts about the situation which then becomes the justification for your lack of faith. You will make this error, but be not at all concerned with that. The error does not matter. Faithlessness brought to faith will never interfere with truth, but faithlessness used against truth will always destroy faith. If you lack faith, Ask that it be restored where it was lost, and seek not to have it made up to you elsewhere, as if you had been unjustly deprived of it. Only what you have not given can be lacking in any situation. But remember this, the goal of holiness was set for your relationship, and not by you. You did not set it because holiness cannot be seen except through faith. And your relationship was not holy because your faith in your brother was so limited and little. Your faith must grow to meet the goal that has been set. The goal's reality will call this forth. For you will see that peace and faith will not come separately. What situation can you be in without faith and remain faithful to your brother? Every situation in which you find yourself is but a means to meet the purpose set for your relationship. See it as something else and you are faithless. Use not your faithlessness. Let it enter and look upon it calmly, but do not use it. Faithlessness is the servant of illusion and wholly faithful to its master. Use it and it will carry you straight to illusions. Be tempted not by what it offers you. It interferes, not with the goal, but with the value of the goal to you. Accept not the illusion of peace it offers, but look upon its offering and recognize it is illusion. The goal of illusion is as closely tied to faithlessness as faith to truth. If you lack faith in anyone to fulfill, and perfectly, his part in any situation dedicated in advance to truth, your dedication is divided, 
And so you have been faithless to your brother and used your faithlessness against him. No relationship is holy unless its holiness goes with it everywhere. As holiness and faith go hand in hand, so must its faith go everywhere with it. The goal's reality will call forth and accomplish every miracle needed for its fulfillment. Nothing too small or too enormous, too weak or too compelling, but will be gently turned to its use and purpose. The universe will serve it gladly as it serves the universe, but do not interfere. The power set in you in whom the Holy Spirit's goal has been established is so far beyond your little conception of the infinite that you have no idea how the great how great the strength that goes with you. And you can use this in perfect safety. Yet for all its might, so great it reaches past the stars and to the universe that lies beyond them, your little faithlessness can make it useless if you would use the faithlessness instead. Yet think on this and learn the cause of faithlessness. You think you hold against your brother what he has done to you. But what you really blame him for is what you did to him. It is not his past, but yours you hold against him. And you lack faith in him because of what you were. Yet you are as innocent of what you were as he is. What never was is causeless and is not there to interfere with truth. There is no cause for faithlessness, but there is cause for faith. That cause has entered any situation that shares its purpose. The light of truth shines from the center of the situation and touches everyone to whom the situation's purpose calls. It calls to everyone. There is no situation that does not involve your whole relationship in every aspect and complete in every part. You can leave nothing of yourself outside it and keep the situation holy. For it shares the purpose of your whole relationship and derives its meaning from it. Enter each situation with the faith you give your brother or you are faithless to your own relationship. Your faith will call the others to share your purpose as the same purpose called forth the faith in you. And you will see the means you once employed to lead you to illusions transformed to means for truth. Truth calls for faith and faith makes room for truth. When the Holy Spirit changed the purpose of your relationship by exchanging yours for his, the goal he placed there was extended to every situation in which you enter or will ever enter. And every situation was thus made free of the past, which would have made it purposeless. You call for faith because of him who walks with you in every situation. You are no longer wholly insane, nor no longer alone, for loneliness in God must be a dream. You whose relationship shares the Holy Spirit's goal are set apart from loneliness because the truth has come. Its call for faith is strong. Use not your faithlessness against it, for it calls you to salvation and to peace. Ah, that was a lot. But it was actually really interesting. It made me think a lot about some relationships that I have, right? When you when you go in judging and thinking something about the relationship, and it's really because you've lost faith. Anybody else have anything they want to add or any thoughts that might have come up during that reading? And go ahead, Pam. 
Well, in the last paragraph, it talks about uh, being no longer alone and loneliness. And I was sharing, feeling lonely earlier. Right. And, and of course, we're never alone. Of course, that's the truth. And that can just dawn on me in any moment. And then that loneliness and it doesn't have to, there doesn't have to be anyone else in the room. Right. Yeah. Good point. Good point. I thought paragraph eight was interesting. <clears throat> you think you hold against your brother what he has done to you, but what you really blame him for is what you did to him. That one struck a chord with me for sure. Yeah. That one struck a chord for me. And when it comes to faith, I think too, it's like, um, I think anytime you get caught up in thinking about the, whether it's worry or, or angst or anger or anything like that, really the core issue is that you have lost your faith. You've lost your faith that everything is unfolding exactly the way it's supposed to. It's always for your highest good. You always can ask for help in dealing with whatever's coming up and, and, you know, how egotistical is that to think that you're the one that's going to fix it when it's already fixed. So that that paragraph eight was a big one. Yeah. And, and also paragraph three, <clears throat> where it says the thought of bodies is the sign of faithlessness. Right. Because if the goal is truth. Some idea of the body must have entered where minds cannot attack, right? So the thought of bodies is the sign of faithlessness where bodies cannot solve anything. And that's funny, we were talking about bodies, right? Because really, if if we're if we're judging or we're thinking that someone had done something to us or we had done something to them, we don't think of it as their minds, right? We immediately think of it as their bodies. Yeah. So that's also interesting. All right. Well, I guess we should continue to the conditions of peace, unless there's more conversation about this. I'll just say one thing in paragraph, I think it's paragraph one, the last sentence, number seven. And I had this underlined from a previous reading. To remove the problem elsewhere is to keep it, for you, you remove yourself from it and make it unsolvable. And then in the margin, I, I wrote denial. Yeah. That's what we were, we were also talking about that earlier. Oh my gosh, how interesting. I love when that happens. That's so interesting. That is so true. We were talking about denial. We we're talking about bodies. We were talking about, you know, all of these things. So interesting. All right, anybody else before I continue? All right, let's keep going to the conditions of peace. The holy instant is nothing more than a special case or an extreme example of what every situation is meant to be. The meaning that the Holy Spirit's purpose has given it is also given to every situation. It calls forth just the same suspension of faithlessness, withheld and left unused, that faith might answer to the call of truth. The holy instant is the shining example, the clear and unequivocal, unequivocal demonstration of the meaning of every relationship in every situation seen as a whole. Faith has accepted every aspect of the situation and faithlessness has not forced any exclusion on it. It is a situation of perfect peace simply because you have let it be what it is. This simple courtesy is all the Holy Spirit asks of you. Let truth be what it is. Do not intrude upon it. Do not attack it. Do not interrupt its coming. Let, us, let it encompass every situation and bring you peace. 
Not even faith is asked of you, for truth asks nothing. Let it enter, and it will call forth and secure for you the faith you need for peace. But rise you not against it, for against your opposition it cannot come. Would you not want to make a holy instant of every situation? For such is the gift of faith, freely given, wherever faithlessness is laid aside unused. And then the power of the Holy Spirit's purpose is free to use instead. This power instantly transforms all situations into one sure and continuous means for establishing his purpose and demonstrating its reality. What has been demonstrated has called for faith and has been given it. Now it becomes a fact from which faith can no longer be withheld. The strain of refusing faith to truth is enormous and far greater than you realize. But to answer truth with faith entails no strain at all. To you who have acknowledged the call of your Redeemer, the strain of not responding to his call seems to be greater than before. This is not so. Before, the strain was there, but you attributed it to something else, believing that the something else produced it. This was never true. For what the something else produced was sorrow and depression, sickness and pain, darkness and dim imaginings of terror, cold fantasies of fear and fiery dreams of hell. And it was nothing but the intolerable strain of refusing to give faith to truth and see its evident reality. Such was the crucifixion of the Son of God. His faithlessness did this to him. Think carefully before you let yourself use faithlessness against him. For he is risen and you have accepted the cause of his awakening as yours. You have assumed your part in his redemption, and you are now fully responsible to him. Fail him not now, for it has been given you to realize what your lack of faith in him must mean to you. His salvation is your only purpose. See only this in every situation, and it will be a means for bringing only this. When you accepted truth as your goal for your relationship, you became a giver of peace, as surely as your father gave peace to you. For the goal of peace cannot be accepted apart from its conditions. And you had faith in it, for no one accepts what he does not believe is real. Your purpose has not changed and will not change, for you accepted what can never change and nothing that it needs to be forever changeless can you now withhold from it. Your release is certain. Give as you have received and demonstrate that you have risen far beyond any situation that could hold you back and keep you separate from him whose call you answered. <sighs> okay. So the conditions of peace are simply to allow truth to enter and have faith. Boy, that seems simple. <laughs> what exactly is simple about that? What, what, Eric? What exactly is simple about it? Well, it seems simple because our mind creates all of these things that are oppositions to it right and if we realize that all we needed to do was allow truth to enter and have faith that we're already aligned with the one mind of god let's see how would you know that well you'd probably know that by your feeling of joy versus your feeling of pain Oh. If you're aligned with fear, you wouldn't be feeling joy. If you're aligned with anything above the place of peace, which would be joy, happiness, 
freedom, then you know you're aligned with love. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Well, it makes sense, but how could you test it? How would you test it? Mm -hmm. Well, there's there's a lot of different ways to test it. If you're looking to actually scientifically test it, you yeah, could scientifically. probably... Pardon me? That's what I mean, scientifically. Yeah, well, you can test it by using kinesiology, right? Uh, so yeah, um, that, that's a, pardon me? David R. Hawkins. Yes. You mm -hmm. like map the consciousness map ideas. Did you read any of his books? Uh, yep, I've got it right here, actually. One of his books. Power versus force. Power versus force, yeah. Yeah, and here's the map of consciousness. And you can yeah, see right it. here all of the different measurements of the frequencies. So you yes. can you can use kinesiology to test to see if in fact you're vibrating in such a uh, calibrating in such a way as that you understand the truth. Yes, if that was something that was important to you. Or at least you're with the truth, so you're not disturbed. Right. Okay. So they're in his peace then. Is that what you're saying? Well, that would not be how I would arrive at peace, but if somebody was looking for proof, that's a way of getting some type of scientific mm -hmm. measurement. I think that's what your question was. I mean, for me, my my way of knowing I'm at peace is being able to feel within my energetic being that feeling of love, that feeling of safety, that feeling of joy. Um, but your, what is your calibration? Do you know that? Like, is your, is your, calibration love and above or is it courage and below or where, where do you think you're at well i i don't like everything's really filtered through those perspectives of awareness so my if my perspective of awareness is is a uh, um self-will pride um then i'm i'm still really in trouble i, I think i'm i think i'm doing fine i'm doing really great but I'm really full of myself. So there are ways to to really wrap your mind about around those things. And I think to get back to what we're reading in A Course in Miracles, you can simplify it by choosing to have faith and choosing to be in that mindset of um, allowing and alignment. And, and I think sometimes when we get into um, a lot of discussion about what the ego is, it just kind of pulls us down the rabbit hole even further into that place of justifying and, um, and further away from that place of at one minute. Well, are, you, are you familiar with Ken Wapnick's chart where he has an observer above the atonement? I'm not. No, above I'm not. The battleground. He says it's above the battleground, but it's also there's there's this ego split on the left side of the chart. There's the ego split on the right side of the chart is the atonement. So the atonement it was a rescue plan. I can say, oh, I can I can follow the rescue plan. I can take myself out of this battlefield, out of this confusion, this upset, this worry, uh, out of my anger, my frustration. I can get myself out of this because I can remember that I'm supposed to follow the atonement plan. So the atonement plan might be a way that I could perhaps, perhaps I could set some steps up to do that. So sure. The chapter on decision making helps us to say, like, what kind of day do I want to have? Yeah, I'm sure there's a lot of different. I find what kind of day I want to have, and then it can stay with the idea that I want to have this kind of day, a life worth living kind of day, a life worth living kind of peacefulness, life worth living kind of calm or something like that. Sure. So it helps me to remember the atomic process. The atomic process begins simply with the recognition that I can't do this by myself. God can do for me what I cannot do for myself. So I begin to remember the atonement plan then. I begin to remember, I must start with forgiveness and prayer. 
prayer and forgiveness lets me remember that I'm are you still there? Yeah, yeah, I'm here oh, okay. listening, oh, okay. just listening to you. <laughs> the prayer and forgiveness lets me remember that there's there's a there's a there's an outcome above acceptance of the atonement plan that I'm trying to get to, I'm trying to get to that place where that you're talking about it is you know it's unconditional peace. Is that right? You feel well, that peace and joy, peace, let's say peace and joy, the same thing, really. Love, peace, joy, let's say they're all the same thing, really. Just, just for, just for the argument's so, sake, not for, not for really that we have to distinguish exactly if I'm right or not. Just Well, I think what this, this chapter was talking about is the simple courtesy of letting truth be what it is and not intruding upon it. And not making it more complicated than it is. Yeah, can I jump in and just sort of say that when when we have the the faith that we don't have to prove everything beyond a shadow of a doubt, that's where the word faith comes in and takes us out of our thinking mind, which is... Um, the higher mind doesn't process everything. It just knows on a much deeper level what the truth is and knows that it will be supported by all. And so it doesn't need to process things because when it needs to know something, it will know it because it's supported by its connection to all. So when we get to that point, that we're willing to accept that or at least um, change our belief to be testing that out and gaining comfort in that knowing, that knowing will deepen. Just like we don't question when we get up in the morning if the floor is going to support us. We throw ourselves out of bed, we stand on the floor, and we do whatever we're doing when you are at that knowing place, that confidence in that God, eternal, infinite connection to life, then that's your new place of operation. And that's what you're going for. We don't test the floor every day. We just have an assumption, if you will, or a knowing that that's assured. That's our premise. And so God, life itself, becomes that same premise. And you can think of countless ways to get there, or you can just take the shortcut. Either way is fully acceptable, because that's what our individuations, our personalities, if you will, give us the choices to make. That's our experience. Well, are there really any choices in this experience of bliss like you're talking about? The ultimate choice is to just choose it over separation. That's the ultimate choice. In the realm of separation in this life experience, we have a million other choices. Each choice is the opportunity for another experience. Yeah. That's where we have choice. We exercise our choice, meaning we choose a different experience each time. Ultimately, there's only the one choice of love or fear, communion or separation. So this is the complication that I'm speaking about. Or I haven't spoken directly about it yet. I decided not to do that right off the bat. Instead, I asked the question instead. So this is the, the complication that I'm, I'm, I'm looking at. I'm looking at the complication. If I want to stay above the upsets, the confusion, the difficulties, the dilemmas, blame, shame, judgment, and so on and so forth, if I want to stay above doubt, then I want to be fearless and I want to be peaceful, peacefully fear, fearless, lovingly joyful. I want to be alone in that awareness. I don't want to be disrupted by all kinds of other stuff. Yeah, and I think paragraph two kind of answers your question um, where it says, 
Let truth be what it is. Do not intrude upon it. Do not attack it. Do not interrupt its coming. Let it encompass every situation and bring you peace. Yes. Not even faith is asked of you, for truth asks nothing. Let it enter and it will call forth and secure for you the faith you need for peace. But rise you not against it, for against your opposition, it cannot come. Yeah. So in other words, there isn't really any change that can occur. However, you can imagine that you can change whatever you want to change. So you, so altering the truth is not so hard to do if, if what you believe is that there is such a thing as change. Right. Yeah, so much is paradoxical, isn't it? In, in, in truth, it's all kind of how we experience things here versus the, the whole truth. The ultimate of, truth. Right. Of things ultimate truth of things but um it's just it's it's all for us to explore and experience um this this way of being which may seem foreign and, and strange but the more you opt to do it then the more familiar it is <clears throat> and the more you will you know opt to stay in it because then the choices are clear. The, the vision, the path is clear because you're not disrupted by all these other things. It's like you can't solve the problem from the level of the problem. So you're looking for proof in a very narrow, separated point of view, whereas when you encompass all the aspects, then the proof is is right there but it's kind of disguised when you're only looking in one tiny little area and can't see the whole great point mary and also i feel like pam and i were talking about this a little bit earlier too it's about the practice right it, it really is and i think a big part of a course in miracles is that the lessons are imperative to do while you're reading the text because the lessons are actually the practice the lessons are where the undoing occurs the lessons are where the experience occurs um so without the lessons and just reading the text i think you you kind of i don't mean you personally i think me you know if i'm going to be reading the text and not the lessons i'm not going to have the experiences which is going to bring the faith because it's going to show me right then and there where my mind is. And by changing my mind about a certain thing or by doing a particular lesson, I can see something completely different than I thought was there before. All right. Any more discussion or should we continue to chapter 18, the passing of the dream? I just ask, was that helpful at all? anybody um i mean it's if it was helpful for you eric that's the important part right for me it's just a, it's a yeah for me it's a review so i'm looking at yeah. the well, i think everybody's at their own place in the course and i think when people have questions they bring them up if they're if it pertains to something that they're that's on their mind. So yeah, that's, and that's part of this discussion is that when you have a question that it's great to bring that up so that we can all talk about it as a group. Mm -hmm. um, I found it very helpful for looking at uh, it through Ken Wapnick's teaching of the chart that I was speaking about. He calls it the, I, the um, separation. Okay. Uh, yeah, you know, one more thing I want to bring up is that if we are thinking that we have to prove something, if you will, then the thought below that or behind that is that we don't have something. And if we have it already and our leap of faith, if you will, is just to take the blocks away then trying to prove something is just another distraction Science rather than that place about to, to, to remove the block so it's not about obtaining anything we don't already have but i wasn't asking about proof 
I thought you were in the beginning. I meant, I used that word, but I later I corrected it when I said I'm more scientifically interested in it. So how scientifically does it work? Mm. Scientifically, it's falsifiable or it's not falsifiable. It becomes it becomes a theorem or it becomes a theory or it becomes reality, which is so it's very stages. Reality is very difficult to prove. In other words, to get to reality, you have to show you exactly what's what's going on with everything, essentially, to get to reality. Reality is everything there is. Well, so, the good news is we're going to read about that in the next section. Yes. The passing of the dream and the substitute reality. So chapter and 17. And that segue, chapter 18, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen so we can start Perfect. down that path. All right, thank you. All right. Chapter 18, The Passing of the Dream, The Substitute Reality. <clears throat> to substitute is to accept instead. If you would but consider exactly what this entails, you would perceive at once how much at variance this is with the goal the Holy Spirit has given you and would accomplish for you. To substitute is to choose between renouncing one aspect of the sonship in favor of the other. For this special purpose, one is judged more valuable and the other is replaced by him. The relationship in which the substitution occurred is thus fragmented and its purpose split accordingly. To fragment is to exclude and substitution is the strongest defense the ego has for separation. The Holy Spirit never uses substitutes. Where the ego perceives one person as a replacement for another, the Holy Spirit sees them joined and indivisible. He does not judge between them, knowing they are one. Being united, they are one because they are the same. Substitution is clearly a process in which they are perceived as different. One would unite, the other separate. Nothing can come between what God has joined and what the Holy Spirit sees as one. But everything seems to come between the fragmented relationships the ego sponsors to destroy. The one emotion in which substitution is impossible is love. Fear involves substitution by definition, for it is love's replacement. Fear is both a fragmented and fragmenting emotion. It seems to take many forms, for each one seems to require a different form of acting out for satisfaction. While this appears to introduce quite variable behavior, a far more serious effect lies in the fragmented perception from which the behavior stems. No one is seen complete. The body is emphasized with special emphasis on certain parts and used as the standard for comparison of acceptance or rejection for acting out a special form of fear. You who believe that God is fear made but one substitution. It has taken many forms because it was the substitution of illusion for truth, of fragmentation for wholeness, it has become so splintered and subdivided and divided again over and over that it is now almost impossible to perceive it once was one and still is what it was. That one error which brought truth to illusion, infinity to time and life to death was all you ever made. Your whole world rests upon it. Everything you see reflects it. And every special relationship that you have ever made is part of it. You may be surprised to hear how very different is reality from what you see. You do not realize the magnitude of that one error. It was so vast and so completely incredible that from it, a world of total unreality had to emerge. What else could come of it? Its fragmented aspects are fearful enough 
as you begin to look at them. But nothing you have seen begins to show you the enormity of the original error, which seemed to cast you out of heaven to shatter knowledge into meaningless bits of disunited perceptions and to force you to make further substitutions. That was the first projection of error outward. The world arose to hide it and became the screen on which it was projected and drawn between you and the truth. For truth extends inward where the idea of loss is meaningless and only increase is conceivable. Do you really think it's strange that a world in which everything is backwards and upside down arose from this projection of error? It was inevitable. For truth brought to this could only remain within it, within in quiet and take no part in all the mad projection by which this world was made. Call it not sin, but madness. For such it was, and so it still remains. Invest it not with guilt. For guilt implies it was accomplished in reality. And above all, be not afraid of it. When you seem to see some twisted form of the original error rising to frighten you, say only, God is not fear, but love. And it will disappear. The truth will save you. It has not left you to go out into the mad world and so depart from you, inward is sanity. Insanity is outside you. You but believe it is the other way. The truth is outside, an error and guilt within. Your little senseless substitutions touched with insanity and swirling lightly off on a mad course like feathers dancing insanely in the wind have no substance. They fuse and merge and separate and shifting in totally meaningless patterns that need not be judged at all. To judge them individually is pointless. Their tiny differences in form are no real differences at all. None of them matters. That they have in common and nothing else. Yet what else is necessary to make them all the same? Let them all go, dancing in the wind, dipping and turning till they disappear from sight far, far outside of you and turn you to the stately calm within, where in holy stillness dwells the living God you never left and who never left you. The Holy Spirit takes you gently by the hand and retraces with you, you your mad journey outside yourself leading you gently back to the truth and safety within. He brings all your insane projections and the wild substitutions that you have placed outside you to the truth. Thus he reverses the course of insanity and restores you to reason. In your relationship with your brother, where he has taken charge of everything at your request, he has set the course inward to the truth you share. In the mad world outside you, nothing can be shared, but only substituted. And sharing and substituting have nothing in common with reality. Within yourself, you love your brother with a perfect love. Here is holy ground in which no substitutions can enter and where only the truth in your brother can abide. Here you are joined in God as much together as you are with him. The original error has not entered here, nor ever will. Here is the radiant truth to which the Holy Spirit has committed your relationship. Let him bring it here, where you would have it be. Give him but a little faith in your brother to help him show you that no substitute you made for heaven can keep you from it. In you, there is no separation, and no substitute can keep you from your brother. Your reality was God's creation and has no substitute. You are so firmly joined in truth that only God is there, and he would never accept something else instead of you. He loves you both equally 
and is one. And as he loves you, so you are. You are not joined together in illusions, but in the thought so holy and so perfect that illusions cannot remain to darken the holy place in which you stand together. God is with you, my brother. Let us join in him in peace and gratitude and accept his gift as our most holy and perfect reality, which we share in him. Heaven is restored to all the sonship through your relationship, for in it lies the sonship, whole and beautiful, safe in your love. Heaven has entered quietly, for all illusions have been gently brought unto the truth in you, and love has shined upon you, blessing your relationship with truth. God and his whole creation have entered it together. How lovely and how holy is your relationship with the truth shining upon it. Heaven beholds it and rejoices that you have let it come to you. And God himself is glad that your relationship is as it was created. The universe within you stands with you together with your brother and heaven looks with love on what is joined in it, along with its creator. Whom God has called should hear no substitutes. Their call is but an echo of the original error that shattered heaven. And what became of peace in those who heard? Return with me to heaven, walking together with your brother out of this world and through another to the loveliness and joy the other holds within it. Would you still further weaken and break apart what is already broken and hopeless? Is it here that you would look for happiness? Or would you not prefer to heal what has been broken and join in making whole what has been ravaged by separation and disease? You have been called together with your brother to the most holy function this world contains. It is the only one that has no limits and reaches out to every broken fragment of the sonship with healing and uniting comfort. This is offered you in your holy relationship. Accept it here and you will give as you have accepted. The peace of God is given you with the glowing purpose in which you join with your brother. The holy light that brought you and him together must extend as you accepted it. <sighs> Another beautiful writing of just how the difference is in looking inside versus going outside. It reminds me of how it is so easy to get pulled into the illusion and the ego in this form of constant battle and judging and 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 just down the rabbit hole, right? Of fear. When all we have to do is go inside. And also that uh the at one moment really is just an infinite series of uh, holy instants strung together. <laughs> right. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. Beautiful. Anybody have any thoughts about this or should we try to read one more section? Go into the basis of the dream. All right. Might as well. Here we go. The basis of the dream. Does not a world that seems quite real arise in dreams? Yet think what this world is. It is clearly not the world you saw before you slept. Rather, it is a distortion of the world. 
planned solely around what you would have preferred. Here you are free to make over whatever seemed to attack you and change it into a tribute to your ego, which was outraged by the attack. This would not be your wish unless you saw yourself as one with the ego, which always looks upon itself and therefore on you as under attack and highly vulnerable to it. Dreams are chaotic because they're governed by your conflicting wishes, and therefore they have no concern with what is true. They are the best example you could have of how perception can be utilized to substitute illusions for truth. You do not take them seriously on awaking because the fact that reality is so outrageously violated in them becomes apparent. Yet they are a way of looking at the world and changing it to suit the ego better. They provide striking examples, both of the ego's inability to tolerate reality and of your willingness to change reality on its behalf. You do not find the differences between what you see in sleep and on waking disturbing. You recognize that what you see on waking is blotted out in dreams. Yet on awakening, you do not expect it to be gone. In dreams, you arrange everything. People become what you would have them be, and what they do, you order. No limits on substitution are laid upon you. For a time, it seems as if the world were given you to make it what you wish. You do not realize you are attacking it, trying to triumph over it and make it serve you. Dreams are perceptual temper tantrums in which you literally scream, I want it thus, and thus it seems to be. And yet the dream cannot escape its origin. Anger and fear pervade it. And in an instant, the illusion of satisfaction is invaded by the illusion of terror. For the dream of your ability to control reality by substituting a world that you prefer is terrifying. Your attempts to blot out reality are very fearful, but this you are not willing to accept. And so you substitute the fantasy that reality is fearful, not what you would want would do to it. And thus is guilt made real. Dreams show you that you have the power to make a world as you would have it be. And that because you want it, you see it. And while you see it, you do not doubt that it is real. Yet here is a world clearly within your mind that seems to be outside. You do not respond to it as though you made it, nor do you realize that the emotions the dream produces must come from you. It is the figures in the dream and what they do that seem to make the dream. You do not realize that you are making them act out for you. For if you did, the guilt would not be theirs and the illusion of satisfaction would be gone. In dreams, these figures are not obscure. You seem to waken and the dream is gone. Yet what you fail to recognize is that what caused the dream has not gone with it. Your wish to make another world that is not real remains with you. And what you seem to waken to is but another form of this same world you see in dreams. All your time is spent in dreaming. Your sleeping and your waking dreams have different forms, and that is all. Their content is the same. They are your protest against reality and your fixed and insane idea that you can change it. In your waking dreams, the special relationship has a special place. It is the means by which you try to make your sleeping dreams come true. From this, you do not waken. The special relationship is your determination to keep your hold on unreality and to prevent yourself from waking. And while you see more value in sleeping than in waking, you will not let go of it. The Holy Spirit, ever practical in his wisdom, accepts your dreams and uses them as means for waking. You would have used them to remain asleep. I said before that the first change before dreams disappear is that your dreams of fear are changed to happy dreams. That is what the Holy Spirit does in the special relationship. 
He does not destroy it nor snatch it away from you, but he does use it differently as a help to make his purpose real to you. The special relationship will remain, not as a source of pain and guilt, but as a source of joy and freedom. It will not be for you alone, for therein lay its misery. As its unholiness kept it a thing apart, its holiness will become an offering to everyone. Your special relationship will be a means for undoing guilt and everyone blessed through your holy relationship. It will be a happy dream and one which you will share with all who come within your sight. Through it, the blessing the Holy Spirit has laid upon it will be extended. Think not that he has forgotten anyone in the purpose he has given you, and think not that he has forgotten you to whom he gave the gift. He uses everyone who calls on him as means for salvation of everyone, and he will waken everyone through you who offered your relationship to him. If you but recognized his gratitude or mine through his, for we are joined as in one purpose, being of one mind with him. Let not the dream take hold to close your eyes. It is not strange that dreams can make a world that is unreal. It is the wish to make it that is incredible. Your relationship with your brother has now become one in which the wish has been removed because its purpose has been changed from one of dreams to one of truth. You're not sure of this because you think it may be this that is the dream. You're so used to choosing among dreams, you do not see that you have made at last the choice between the truth and all illusions. Yet heaven is sure. This is no dream. Its coming means that you have chosen truth and it has come because you have been willing to let your special relationship meet its conditions. In your relationship, the Holy Spirit has gently laid the real world, the world of happy dreams, from which awaking is so easy and so natural. For as your sleeping and your waking dreams represent the same wishes in your mind, so do the real world and the truth of heaven join in the will of God. The dream of waking is easily transferred to its reality. For this dream reflects your will joined with the will of God. And what this will would have accomplished has never not been done. Hmm. I love that. Love that analogy of the waking dream and the sleeping dream. And the holy relationship, right? That's a that's an interesting one. To have the um to have the faith to allow your relationship to be transformed to a holy relationship, right? Uh, that was a great section. It was. It really was. I remember when I first read this and I was like, oh my gosh, how is that going to work? I don't know how that's going to work. <laughs> <laughs> I was still in my my marriage to my the father of my children and I thought, oh my gosh, I, I can't even imagine that this would even happen in this relationship. But alas, it has happened. <laughs> it's a miracle <laughs> it's a miracle yeah yeah exactly exactly all right it is 1 30 any burning shares before we close today all right no, thank, thank you, you Terry. thank you everyone for coming great conversation and um hope to see all of you next week all right bye bye, bye guys Good to Bye. see you Thank all. You. Thank Good you. to see you too. Bye. Bye-bye.